Snowball Spark. You want good words? Data languages. Talk real sports with a real man. Come after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. And now, here's the be-all, end-all, know-it-all of high school, college, and pro sports. Aaron Skinny Count with The Skinny on Sports. We're talking about practice, man. I'm the MVP. Good Monday morning out there, Western Oklahoma. Welcome to the Skinny on Sports right here on 98.1 FM, the sports animal. Glad to have you along for the next hour. We can get in all kinds of things. We've got a, game, a World Series game three tonight. Uh, the, man, game one, classic on Friday. Game two, meh, on Saturday. Even series going into uh, the three games out in the desert. Can the Rangers ever lose on the road? Still haven't in the playoffs. So if that continues, uh, we'll have a champion one on Wednesday. Uh, Thunder off to a nice start, uh, despite getting beat down by the defending champs last night. Detroit's in there tonight. College football weekend, boy, what a horrific performance from the Oklahoma Sooners. Almost escaped it, too. That's what is almost it, the worst part about the whole thing. She played terrible throughout most of that game, and you have a chance to sneak out with a win and could not get it done. Lots and lots and lots and lots of Sooner fans have their ire pointed at one guy. Is it? Should it be at that guy? Should Jeff Levy be the one taking all the heat after that loss? And, but I think it's fair to ask what happened. What happened to the offense that we had seen throughout most of the year? Last two games have not been very good. Uh, Oklahoma State, what an unbelievable turnaround, the turnaround they continue to be on. Now you look up with just a few weeks left in the regular season schedule. There's a five-way tie for first in the Big 12, and they are a part of it after their what fourth straight win, all in conference. Is Ollie Gordon, what, what does he have to do to get mentioned into the Heisman race? Back-to-back over 200. What if, it, does, if he does that again Saturday against Oklahoma and Bedlam? He's already leading the country in rushing after the way the season started. You think where think where that number could be if he gets carries in the first three games like he is now. So what would it take to see him kind of starting? He got some mention on the college football final show on ESPN on Saturday night. So how much would that have to what, – what would he have to do for that to be serious? Elimination weekend in the Big 12 coming up this week with Texas – hosting Kansas State and obviously Bedlam and Stillwater. Two teams that lose on Saturday, it's going to be a pretty winding road for them to get back to Arlington. And then high school football, week nine in the books. What happened in 4A1? What does it mean for this week's games? 4A2 clearing up, um, basically down to one game now uh, to, to decide kind of what that order is in 4A2 and how they match up in the first round of the playoffs with the 4A1 schools. A curveball in Class A District 1 settles the four teams. I thought we might have some drama this week in a Class A District 1. That's over after what we saw. Uh, kind of an upset in a lot of people's minds, I think, on Friday. And then uh, B1 is pretty clear after Friday night with the two, uh, with all four teams that are going to be in the playoffs playing each other. That pretty well settles kind of what the order there will probably be when we look up coming up uh, a week ago or a week from right now. 225-9698 is the phone or the text line. That's 225-9698. Give us a call. Shoot us a text. We'll talk about any of those things. Whatever else might be on your mind, feel free to chime right in at 225-9698. If you're going to be outside the listening area, there are a couple ways to stay in touch with the show. Log on to KADSAM.com or download the app. The app's got it all. It's got radio. It's got the Penny News, Big Elk, and Paragon TV, which not only this week football, but also this week Small school basketball gets cranking on Friday. So there's Paragon TV will be hopping from now until the first weekend in March with all kinds of different high school sports on there. As football ends, basketball gets going. Um, and also Skinny on Sports Podcast. If you miss our show entirely, you can find it anywhere where there are podcasts. How are you today, Jared? I'm good. How are you? Enjoying those cold weather? Man, we play, played in the, the baseball boosters golf tournament on Saturday. How'd that go? It was cold. It was it was very cold. 
very cold. <laughs> just that's all you can it describe was, it, it as. It just, just was very I mean, cold. <laughs> it was just it was really cold, man. Did uh, it did it uh, did it hamper the the spirits or the participation or did it, was uh, there was like still, two or three teams that didn't show up? It was still a good turnout. But yeah, it was yeah, yeah it was a good time. Everybody had fun. It was just uh, it was just it, yeah, it was cold. There's no doubt. And then we couple that with you know the only weekend that it had been like that you know the saturday before it was like 80 yeah and then this weekend coming up it's going to be in the 70s it was just kind of a tough break there <laughs> like sandwich right in the middle uh was this weekend but no it was uh it was a good time everybody had a lot of fun and a bunch of people back uh, that had played baseball in elk city and that's cool coached. So it was cool it was it was a good good event for the first one i think it was probably i don't have to consider it a giant success and then uh you know, hopefully you build on it and maybe get a little bit uh, a sooner date on the calendar next year to where that's not quite as, uh, you know, the, the weather's not quite right. as much of a, of a possibility. You're shooting factor. for that autumn, summerish, like, or well, you call just, it, yeah, but that, uh, but that uh, autumn weather. You, you know, just don't cool, know. Cool in the morning and then nice in the afternoon, midday even. Yeah, but you never know. It's, that's that's, that's the, the part. Yeah. When you get into even early October, you just don't know. Like I said, last weekend was gorgeous. This weekend's going to be gorgeous, and then what we just went through Saturday wasn't. So, it is what it is. But it was good, uh, good time, good time. All right, Friday night. Speaking of cool, that was kind of the first football weather game yeah. of the season for the Elks. Because it seemed like the the a Friday or two that were something kind of uh, some cooler weather had blown in. The Elks had played on Thursday. You know, like they they missed those, right. those nights. But that was certainly one of them on Friday, Woodward in town. You know, if you look at that game, for 44 of the 48 minutes, the Elks did everything they wanted to and absolutely dominated uh, Woodward from from the word go. That four-minute stretch there right before the, the halftime was the only, was just a couple of mistakes. And, you know, the Elks end up – you're looking up thinking, okay, it's going to be 28 nothing at half, and then it'll be 35 nothing coming out of the second uh, – the third-quarter locker room, and then we'll – I'll turn on the light in the press box so I can figure out, <laughs> kind of find the names and the numbers of guys that maybe don't get to play as much. And then it was like, they were, it's a game, you know, at halftime after the two uh, turnovers that led to Woodward t- uh, touchdowns. And so, but I think you take 95% of that game was a- absolutely what you thought you'd see, and, and the Elks were very, 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 very good. Yeah, outside of that – uh, outside of those turnovers in the second quarter, they were very, very good. And, and I like their response. I'm, I'm a big guy on that. If you've listened to us on Big Oak TV, I always always say that. Like, okay, let's see how they respond. And they always do. They, under the last three, four seasons, they've always had a nice response. So they came out of that locker room more focused, I think, and they responded well, and they, they did what we thought they'd do. They'd do. So – um, it was nice to, and then you know, um, still got some of those young guys in there towards the end of the game, which is very valuable. But um, yeah, turnovers will do that. I mean, you can't give the ball. I don't care what quality of team you're playing against. You can't give the ball back to them, especially deep in your in your part of the field. So yeah, that was the thing that hurt. The one obviously the fumble was returned for a touchdown, and then the next it was like at the twenty four. Here the thing, if even even if that first fumble on fourth down, if it just goes out of bounds. We're not even talking about it because Woodward's not going to score. Yeah, the the field was so short. Yeah, one one was returned for a touchdown. The other, it was just it one play. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They had yeah. what they end up with like 68 yards of total offense. Was, you look at the box, and if you didn't watch the game, you thought, well, d- dominated all night. Not yeah, well, and they did. That, I mean, they, knowing, yeah, they yeah. really did. I and mean, they did. They did. I'm not. It was, I'm not downplaying it, that, but I'm I'm saying that. If you watch the game, you go, "Wow, there's there's those turnovers," and Woodward was around. But if you just picked up the paper and looked at the box, go, "Oh, well, it looked like Elks they took care of business," and they and did. They, they did. But, that's but whole... it's just it, that's why. It, I guess that's a learning tool you can use. Like this is what happens if you turn the ball over. Yeah, this and that's something happens. that ha- that's something that the Elks haven't done. Not really, not at all. Throughout no. this, that's that's why it was such a, kind of an anomaly. I think we were speechless. We were like. This is we haven't seen this <laughs> no, all year. No, uh, since the you know the, there was some snap stuff at the very first of the season, but once that was corrected, I mean, as far as just in the run of play, fumbling the football, it really hasn't happened hardly at all. No, 
all of a sudden you looked up and there was two in a row. And anyway, I mean, that, let's. But as much as halftime was what it was, thinking, gosh, what just happened? There was never, ever, ever a point where I was seriously considering Woodward actually winning that game. It was just, it was one of those, okay, if the Elks just don't give them two touchdowns, this game is already over. Right. And that's what happened in the second half. They just continued. The defense was so good that, you know, you look up and you go 14 points to Woodward. What? That, that hadn't, nobody's given those up in the, in the district. Well, it, <laughs> it's not, like I said, one of them was a defensive score and the other was one play because of where the ball was turned over on that ensuing kickoff so, or the ensuing drive. So. All in all, I mean, I don't think – as much as it was kind of like weird at halftime, after those two after those two things had happened, it still wasn't – you just kind of had an idea, okay, get back to what they, what they did, and, and this is going to be what we expect. Yeah, and I've and said, that's what it was. I've said this before, I said, this season. I said it early in the year when, uh, you know, the Bridge Creek game was a little closer than what we thought, you know, and – we were like, all right, you know, I, I'm satisfied with the win, obviously, and I'm also kind of oddly satisfied. We learned more things about ourselves, what we got to work on, and and yet now as we turn get to that third part of the season, the playoffs, we could look at that. So, okay, guys, we, we think we're ready and to go here, week nine, and we still have things we can work on and be better mm-hmm. moving forward. And you know, we saw some of that against Woodward too. So, in a weird, I know it's weird to say, it's like, okay, I'm kind of glad they saw adversity. To and then responded very nicely in the second half. But yep. you know, it you'd won a perfect game, but when you see the fumbles and you see the mistakes, like okay, well we can work on this stuff. And they, and I thought and and it was really good to see. And I said it over. I'm going to say it again and again. Coming out of the locker room like they did, doing it in the game instead of letting those fumbles stick with you the entire game. That tells me they're mentally strong. Yep, and and, and it's just some you can get away with that this week. You can't get away with that here in a couple weeks. Um, elsewhere in 4A1, the shocker of the night was obviously Clinton going down to cash and not sewing up the district championship as they fall to the Bulldogs 7 nothing. Uh, when I went back and kind of watched just bits and pieces on Friday night, because we were kind of wondering, what wonder what happened? What are they doing? They had the guys in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did. They play, you know, it wasn't one of those rest and, rest and yeah. you know, that they had their guys and it just – Looked like they got kind of moved the ball a little bit, but then they got down there and couldn't score in in the red zone, which is something that people normally do against them, not you know them having the troubles. Yeah, it doesn't. It, I had a bunch of texts Friday night and even Saturday. What does this do? What does it do? Me too. Really, nothing yet. I mean, now it makes it makes it makes everyone's game this week. Matter. Ours, theirs, yeah. Weatherford's obviously off. They're done. Mm-hmm. But it, it, so I kind of want to say thanks, Clinton, because now it intensifies our preparation for John Marshall. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, you Because you never know what can happen. So, it's, okay, let's go take care of business in Oklahoma City, and let's see what happens in Woodward. Yeah. I mean, it, it's still, the the chances are still way, way on the side of Clinton being the district champ, because all they have to do, as you said, take care of Woodward, and it's on the road. Unless Woodward clones about... Nine more of the, that long kid. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, it's still Clinton's district to lose. And that's just – That might have been a wake-up call for them too. It that's, could be. Uh, sorry about your luck, Woodward, but now you got a mad Clinton team coming to town. Yeah, very well. Very, that's very crazy. Well. I mean, it's 7-0. And I took – you know, after going back and seeing some of it, thinking, well, the defense showed up. I mean, if you could hold a team just seven points, you'd think the offense, especially Clinton, their offense would get it done. It's like the offense just wasn't clicking. That's and here's how what's, I would describe it. Here's what's crazy to me about this is it doesn't even really help Cash at all either. When you look ahead to this week, winning that game didn't really make a difference because they still have to beat they Chickasha. They still have to take care of business. That's right. <laughs> they still have to beat Chickasha or the Chicks will be in the playoffs and Cash will be out. That's what's, that's what's pretty wild about, you know, but I guess that's why you do the work early. Uh, but – so coming up this week, yeah, Clinton has to win now to be the district champs. If not, if something crazy happens again, then the Elks would be there in position uh, to take advantage of it with the win. I, I don't think anybody really expects that to even be a chance, but 
it is not – I mean, it's still mathematically possible is what I'll say about that. Uh, Weatherford's third. That's done. They, they, they don't play, but it doesn't matter. They're third. Because even if Cash were to, to tie them at 4-2 and two with a win, Weatherford gets the, the tie break because they beat Cash. So uh, we know whether – here's the deal. We know a game. We know a first-round playoff game. Tuttle. Weatherford goes to Tuttle. That's locked in. Tuttle is second. Weatherford is third. Blanchard wrapped it up, didn't they? Blanchard wrapped up the district. With their win against That's right. Bethany. So, so third and fourth and 4A2 still up for grabs? Correct. Newcastle, Bethany. They play this week. The winner right. comes here. The loser goes to Clinton, more than likely, if it if the standings stay the same at the top of 4A1. According to our Newcastle resident, Trey, he said – Tuttle had no business beating Newcastle. There's, uh, I didn't see the. There's some funky stuff happening. Okay, so I Newca- did you see? I saw you, the very la- the the very end. It was on. I just happened to be on Channel Four. You know, you watch on Channel Nine. No, oh. I, I didn't see it there. They, Channel Four actually had cameras out. Oh, that's good for them. And it in here, it, it was hard to kind of tell what happened, but it. So Newcastle was kind of driving to win the game. It was fourteen thirteen Tuttle. They fumble. Tuttle gets the recovery. And so they're just in victory formation. And as they snap it, the Newcastle linemen like dove in there and, and took the ball. Did they allow that? No. Oh, is it offsides or no, there no. there wasn't really an explanation on the on the sports cast. They just basically said uh Tuttle won the game. I'll have to go back and see what he – because we he texted us in our game, so it's hard for me to look at a bunch of texts when we're broadcasting. And I just kind of glanced down, and he said Tuttle had no business winning that game. So I wonder what happened. I need to find out. Yeah, there was. It, was, it looked like Tuttle. They were in the lead. It was thirteen nothing Newcastle. For, I'm sorry, Newcastle yeah. in the lead forever. And I didn't think that that lead's not safe. Tuttle will find a way, and they did. Yeah. So that uh, so Blanchard won Tuttle two. And then whoever wins Newcastle, Bethany will be three. The other team will be four, and that'll that'll pair up with the the teams in in four A one. Which if Clinton takes care of Woodward as we expect, they'll play the loser of Newcastle, Bethany. The Elks will play the winner of Newcastle, Bethany. Weatherford's going to Tuttle, and whoever wins Chickasha Cash is going to Blanchard. That'll be your first round matchups. Also, uh, down the line a little bit further. So just to clarify, we will get the. Tuttle, or I'm sorry, Newcastle, Newcastle Bethany winner. winner. That's correct. So that's Clinton the, will more than well more than likely. That's right, right, and Clinton would get the loser if something happens in Woodward. We would get the loser, the of that loser game. of that game. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we're isn't it fun? Week ten, we're going to be doing a lot of scoreboard watching, other than our own. I think it's pretty obvious what's going to happen. I think you're going to have a rematch of last year's first round. I think Newcastle will beat Bethany and they'll come out here. And Fun. That may, that may not be the best. It's 4 8 2. I don't know who you want. Anyhow. Classen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tecumseh. Tecumseh, maybe. We've seen Bridge Creek. Yeah. Bring them out again. Um, let's see. How about Dis- the Almighty Hera? I thought they were the. Yeah. They <laughs> two and four. They're the best of the rest, I guess. Four. I'm uh, uh, sorry. Class A District 1. Thought there might be some drama coming up this week with games of, of teams that might still be alive. That changed completely when Moreland went to Thomas and beat the Terriers twenty two to twelve. And so the four teams in Class A District One are set. And the only the only drama now is whether or not Moreland beats Texoma. And, st- and wins the third place tiebreak with Thomas. Fairview wins the district. Hooker's second. And then you've got, well, I guess that's maybe, 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 maybe. Hooker and plays Thomas. So that could change a little bit. But the four schools are there. It's Fairview, Hooker, Thomas, and Moreland. Uh, we thought Sayre might have a chance to get involved in a tiebreak with that win that they had on Friday against Texoma. but a good, all, good win, Yeah, it was. Way. But all of it was taken away when uh, Moreland beat Thomas. So uh, we know what the four teams are there. We also know what the four teams are in Class B, District 1, and pretty close to the order. Laverne won the district with a win over Turpin. 
And then Shattuck and Hollis. Shattuck now has the tiebreak over Hollis for third and fourth as they uh, knocked off the Tigers 44-14. The one thing that could change any of this would be if Hollis were to be able to upset Turpin. How about if you're Turpin? You could fall from second to four. Eh, probably not with the points. But that's the one game that does still matter. If if Turpin beats Hollis, then it's exactly the order is set. Laverne, Turpin, Shattuck, Hollis. But if Hollis were to be were, were to upset Turpin, then we could have some some funky stuff going on right there, especially if they beat him by enough to where the points would almost possibly completely flip from what they are now. Because you'd assume Shattuck would get 15, which would put, put them at 22. It would probably... Mm, this, it would totally depend on how bad Hollis would be Turpin if they were able to beat him. If they beat him by enough, then you could have Laverne, Shattuck, Hollis, Turpin. So, but we do know the four in both of those districts uh, set. Nothing really matter. Nothing matters as far as making or missing the playoffs right. coming up this week. So, week ten high school football. It's going to be fun, and then of course playoffs start the week after that. So, still stuff to be decided. There's no doubt. But we do have a lot. That muddy picture we had on Friday has cleared up a lot more, especially in 4A2. But who? I don't think anybody saw that the the picture wouldn't be completely clear in 4A1. Right. I mean, because I, I, had, I had already assumed Clinton, Elk City, Weatherford, whoever wins, Cash Chicken Shave, we would know that for sure. But we don't yet. Hi, everybody. This is David Osterloh. Many of you know me because I ran a retail business in Elk City for over 30 years. That's where I learned that if you take care of your customers, they will take care of you. So when it was time to look for a career in real estate, I wanted to land someplace that had the same principles. Western Oklahoma Realty seemed like a natural fit. Putting people before property is the same as taking care of your customers. Since I've been at Western Oklahoma Realty, I've come to understand that is how they do business. People before property is not just a hashtag, it's a way of taking care of customers. When you are looking for your next home, we will find a place that your family can call home. When you are going to sell your current home, we will find a buyer that loves your place as much as you do. Western Oklahoma Realty, where putting people before property is a way of life. Come see us at 602 West 3rd Street. We are in the historic greenhouse on the hill, one block west of Homeland. Or you can check out our website, westernoklamarealty.com, or even call us at 580-225-6271. The Skinny on Sports. But is having this minor skill worth being so unattractive? That's for the fan to decide. Yay! Welcome back. Skinny on Sports, 98.1 FM, the sports animal. Hanging out here on a Monday. Let's take a look at the Western Oklahoma Realty College Pick'em standings. Tyler Harrison, Robbie Allen, and all the gang at Western Oklahoma Realty. People before pop property is their motto. Appreciate them helping us out once again with the college pick'em contest. Boy, I started out horrible and finished very strong for a 5-5. Five and five. Been going like five and five the last three weeks. I was I was looking at a pretty pretty rough week, middle of the day. Couldn't get anything right. I was just off. And then everything for the evening changed and I hit the last four to salvage. Salvage a five and five week for me. Looking up at the top of the standings. Big Poppy. Still a a four game lead. It's a different number two, though. It's Traber. And then look at this massive, massive tie for third. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people tied third. And then another six or seven, one behind, which is where we find you at 11th. 10 over 500 at 50 and 40. Lots of good stuff. Still plenty of time to catch up. Yeah, here's a, I went from 5th to 45th. <laughs> oh. It can happen. Yep. Because everything's kind of so bunched up there that just one bad week. You know, a three or four, three week, uh, a three and three and seven, or a two and eight, and yeah, you plummet down the standings. Down at the bottom, let's see. 
Do we have a new? How many should we have? 90? Yeah, 90 Participants? picks. No, no picks. Oh, oh, picks. Should have 90 picks. That's 15, yeah. Here we go, thirty-five and fifty-five. Paulie's still, but he he would, but he he got up to fifty-fifty this week. That may have helped some people get a little closer. He's got a three-game lead, as near as I can tell, thirty-eight and fifty-two to thirty-five and fifty-five. So a three-game lead at the bottom. But there's some people there. A couple of tough weeks for some for the the people at the bottom. Three guys went seven and three. I'm sure I'd rather have three and seven right about now, with where they're situating in it, situated in the standings. But anyhow, fun times. Keep on watching. It's still what five weeks left. I think four regular season weeks in the conference championship the championship week. week. Yeah. So there's still plenty of uh, plenty of of room to to get to the bottom, and maybe to the top. But you better get hot. Yeah. Big Poppy is not letting up so far this year. On the field, boy. What a weird it was it was just a weird game, I thought, in Lawrence, Kansas with Oklahoma and KU. Uh, there the weather was awful, then there was the delay for lightning, then everything was kind of normal from then on as far as the the administration of the game and the way that it, it was allowed to finish or whatever. But it just, it was it. It's one of those that all teams have. In in any championship year or any non, you know, if you're if you're competing for a title, everybody has a game like that. And yeah, right. it, yeah. you know, this is now two straight for Oklahoma. They wiggled off the hook last week by stopping a two point conversion against UCF. This week, it looked like they did it again. You know, Key Lawrence drops the pick up one with, like, what, two minutes left or whatever it was. And then the very next play, Downs gets the interception, and you're thinking, okay, there it is. One first down, this game is over. And Oklahoma didn't get any yards. It didn't didn't get enough yards. And then have it going for it on fourth and three, and they, Nick Anderson moves. They get a penalty, and then obviously punt it in the end zone. The defense on that last drive was just – uh, terrible. That's the only way you can say it. Uh, zero pressure on the quarterback. Bean had time to step back there, survey the field. Um, Venables, actually, we were, after that golf tournament, watching the end of the game out at the golf course. And uh, on that fourth and sixth play, everyone was yelling, call timeout, because you could. Oklahoma wasn't ready. No. They were not ready not, for that play. Not, it, the, the guys in the back end might have been. The guys on the the, the the guys up front certainly weren't. They're kind of stand up looking around. The ball was snapped, and, and Venables, after the game, said he blew it right there. He mm-hmm. should have called a timeout uh, because he could see that the confusion on the field just didn't get it done, just didn't pull the trigger and, and call that timeout before the ball was snapped. Kudos to KU, though, because they were, they were going, not allowing uh, that to happen. And so you end up 38-33. The Sooners throwing it in the end zone to try to win the game at the end, just couldn't get it done. Coming out of it, it seems like the the ire of the fan base is pointed directly to Jeff Levy for the the play calling, the lack of pat. It, it's isn't it interesting? What has been what has been the issue all year long? Uh, running, run the ball, Levy. Yeah. Run the ball. Why won't you run the ball, Levy? So now in this game, he runs the ball. Now, if you want to say not with the right guys, I'll agree more than 100% with you. Now, Walker going down did not help. And especially in that last possession, after the downs interception, Tawi Walker out there, if he's healthy enough to be out there, I think you see a different result. Because they he would have got 10 yards on four plays. You, cannot, you can't convince me otherwise with the day that he had and the way that he was able to, to move guys on his own. Well, you rushed for 269 yards, and 205 of those were with running backs. So you can't even use the, well, Gabriel had a bunch of yards. He had 60. 
But that was what was working. I I understand. I mean, you look at being through 32 passes, <clears throat> and what Gabriel had only thrown 13 before that last drive to try to go down and win the game. I think he was. He was 11. Yeah, he was yeah. 11 of 13 with a pick and no touchdowns. I just don't. I I don't. In a day like that, with the conditions, the way that they were, you're trying to get out of there by the skin of your teeth. And and I just Oklahoma's offense since. I mean, the Texas game, it gets overshadowed the struggles of the offense in that Texas game because of the final drive. But Gabriel was incredibly inaccurate in that game too. But because you win, you know, winning masks all those things. Last year, it would everybody would have been mad at Gabriel again because he keeps on missing on these the the have to have downs he misses, and he he's been doing that this year too, especially in the last three. But nobody cared until now because it was wins, but it was the great like the great drive at the end against Texas, and it was a great drive. But there's been those issues with the throw game, the inconsistency of it in the last couple and it caught up to him this week um was it conditions did they not do do they just not trust gabriel to make the right decisions that's hard to believe right with what he's done but that's sure what it looked like yeah it it i that was the thing that was kind of going around was does levy trust his quarterback uh the conditions thing I don't know if I I want to believe in that. I mean, I guess some quarterbacks don't care and they'll they'll throw in a monsoon or or on a perfect sunny day. Uh, it didn't affect Kansas quarterback. Uh, he's fifteen to thirty two. <laughs> yeah, I did. Well, I mean, that last drive though. Well, they let him air it out. Had to obviously. That's. So, I don't know, and and that that was the frustrating thing for me was the last or when they needed that first down after the downs pick. Okay. You, you're running it all day against this defense that can't stop the run. Surely they can get 10 yards here on the ground and force them to exhaust all their timeouts and get out of there with the win. And that, I guess that was the frustrating. So I guess the, the inability to run the football there at the end when they needed to, they could do it all day, but they couldn't do it when it mattered. That, that one got me. I was, that one was the frustrating part for me well, on top of the last the defensive i mean they look conf- they look like defensive last year on that mm-hmm. last drive just completely confused um blown blown assignments in the in the secondary you mentioned that one play i mean you had they're still kind of trying to line up and they were confused they should have called the timeout there kudos to venables for owning up to that and i should have called a timeout and i guess that's still where we are getting the growing pains of a now second year head coach i mean now he's gonna file that one go okay i remember that kansas game but it's frustrating, and it, it kind of, you know, last week and this week has kind of brought OU back to reality, and and now, I mean, big question is going up to Stillwater. I mean, that, that's – I'm really concerned. Uh, I mean, how big – does this not – and I'm asking. I'm not giving my opinion. I'm asking. Is Stutzman that valuable on that defense? He was – did he ever get in after mm-hmm. – no. I mean, he is the quarterback of that defense. And I wonder what if. What if he was not hurt? What if there's some other guys that weren't hurt? You mentioned the running back health, and which has been a bugaboo all year. Um, the, that, that just – I wonder what if he was in. Is he that valuable to the defense? I mean, could be. I mean, all we hear is competitive depth, competitive depth, you know. Where is it? Yeah. I, I think even as much as Stutzman – Gentry Williams is a huge, huge part of the defense. He wasn't there. You know, as much as people want to pick on Woody Washington for for last week and, and messing up on one play on the pump and go or whatever, where, the, where John Reese, uh, John Rice Pumley went down the line and then threw it, you know, the long play. Uh-huh. You saw when it came down to it and Kansas having to put together a drive, where did they go? They went away from Woody Washington. It went right at Kenai Walker. Well, if if Williams is there, maybe that's not the case. 
So, I mean, there's no doubt Oklahoma's beat up, but that's not a big enough. That's not the excuse of losing that game. They play. They just didn't play well. And that's now the second straight game where you can say Oklahoma didn't play well. And when you look at the trajectories of the teams coming up on Saturday, you're talking about one seemingly going one way and the other going the other. And Oklahoma State has been fantastic since it since everybody buried them, left them for dead along the side of the road coming off the uh, Iowa State loss. Since then, all they've done is win four in a row, beat the team that just beat Oklahoma, albeit on their home field, but whatever, they still beat them. And now you look up, and, and out of nowhere, Oklahoma State is one of the teams tied for the, the Big 12 lead. I, I don't think anybody saw that coming after losing to Iowa State the way that they did. I know, by the way, Iowa State's there too. What a, I mean, this conference is crazy. And the cool thing about this week coming up is all the top six play each other. Yeah. Bedlam, Texas, Kansas State, and Kansas and Iowa State. So it's going to be an elimination weekend for a few of these teams looking to Stillwater. All right, looking down to Arlington. Let's go. It's Stillwater, Oklahoma State. We wondered on Friday with with uh, the Cincinnati defensive line and and as good as they had been all season if this was going to be kind of the test for OSU's run game well if it was they passed with flying colors as they just ran the ball and at will Ollie Gordon joins a guy you might have heard of Barry Sanders the only two guys in Oklahoma State history to rush for 250 at least uh, 250 or more in two straight games and, man, it, it's amazing the turnaround from what this team started out as and what this team looked like and, and you know, all the, all the issues that we thought they might have. Man, have they been fixed. Offensive line and run game. And, and now where – Ollie Gordon leads the nation in rushing after essentially – not playing <laughs> not playing for what two or three games early and he's raced out he leads the nation in rushing he was mentioned they actually didn't mention him at the end of the college football final show on ESPN um about being involved in the Heisman race i don't know how realistic that is at this point but i tell you what you put up another 250 on the sooners on saturday in a win then i, I actually think that talk starts to get at least warmed up to where we could see him making his way all the way to uh, to New York. When was the last time, and I don't know the answer, I'd have to look this up, when was the last time a Heisman winner was not or had not played for any kind of championship? I mean, a conference championship RG3, or national. RG3, 100% is that, because he didn't. They didn't play for Big 12, no, did they? No, no. Um, before that... My point is they, that kind of goes hand in hand. So as long as they are in the hunt for the Big Twelve title, mm-hmm. the deeper this season, the longer this season goes on. You know, these next what four, five weeks, four weeks. Yeah, he's going to get that attention, sure. But I think everyone's kind of holding off. And they're going, all right, you got to do it against the big boys. And in this case, your in-state rival. And if he goes off and pops off another. 200 plus yard game and has that Heisman moment. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. he'll he'll absolutely be in that discussion. Yeah, he, Lamar Jackson. Lamar, that's a good one. Lamar. Yep. At Louisville. Yep. That's one. But you see, most of mm-hmm. them are attached to either playing for a national title, or just coming off a, co- or playing for a conference title, or just come off a a great season, or a where, quarterback. Or, I mean, that's or, a, that's, a quarterback. that's another that's, thing. That's the that's... two common denominators that you just mentioned right there. Mm-hmm. They're quarterbacks. Yeah. Yeah, that's another. A little bit of a difference here is the the position that he plays. Yep. But uh, this is the, I think this is the question of the day, though. And on the text line, what does Gundy not see in August? I what? wonder if he's just a mad scientist. And he's like, I don't want to get this guy banged up, and I'm not going to use you know, him as much. I wanna, I'm it, only uh, going to use him during conference uh, games. Was it Justice Hill? Or maybe back to Randall? There was one of those where that was his comment. Like everybody's wanting him to get the ball, he said, "Listen, we don't. We want him to have it like 18 times a game, maybe five catches and 13 carries." And and that was his reasoning was wear and tear. I think it was. I think it was Justice Hill. 
Um, but that's got that's got to be a question because we've seen even the quarterback spot now. Bowman has clearly solidified that spot. Yeah. Yeah. What I mean, it's a, it's almost a what if. What if they just make the decision? It's it, it's so bad, and it, it's not the first time this has happened, especially at the quarterback spot, where he clearly played the wrong guy. At least this time, he kind of played him. But that, that's that's almost the thing. Just to me, it's just so baffling. Not 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 even just those decisions, but what I saw in Stillwater. With South Alabama in town, it legitimately looked that night like South Alabama had better players than Oklahoma State. But you know what? When you go back and Jim pounds this every week when the subject comes up, maybe they did have better players on the field because Gordon and Brennan Presley weren't on it or, they were off the or field. weren't getting the ball. Right. I think there was what five touches between them. In that game, I mean, that just it was a head scratcher. It, it and, and it's even more now. Yeah, and the thing is, it's not like Ollie Gordon came out of nowhere. Everybody wanted him to be doing this last year, mm-hmm. <laughs> not even this year, and it still took that many games early in the season for uh, for the for whoever. Uh, I mean, Gundy starts with it. Casey Dunn's got to have some culpability as well as the offensive coordinator and whoever's the running back coach. Of not getting those, getting him out there. It, it's just crazy, and it's and it makes it even more crazy as we see him continue to be. And like I said, it's not like this is some walk on guy that nobody had ever heard of. That just it's this isn't Dom Whaley from whatever year that was at OU that nobody had heard of him, and all of a sudden, hey, who's this guy? No, this is Ollie Gordon. Every, as soon as he signed the dotted line on his uh, to come to Oklahoma State, the hype was there for this guy. And I, I, it's just shocking how long it took to get him there. But here's the here's the deal. They didn't continue to be stubborn. They figured it out, and now, you know, he's getting over twenty t- twenty carries a game, and he is producing like literally only one guy has at that school that's had a ton of good running backs. And that one is a guy that a lot of people think is the best one to ever do it uh, with with Barry Sanders. So, obviously, we'll talk big time bedlam all week long. But you know that's that's the strength on strength in this game is Oklahoma has been really good against the run defensively this year, and obviously, Ollie Gordon uh, has burst upon the scene to where I mean, who's better in the country? At that position, it's hard to find somebody right now better than what he's been doing. Yeah. Nobody just comes to mind, honestly. Nobody just shoots up, pops out at you. Is that because we we are in this era of running back by committee? Yeah, kind of. Where you're seeing sometimes two, three guys being rotated in at that at all these schools that are contenders? I don't know. Well, it's just the way the game's played. It is the way the game's played. But the quarterback is the star. The running back is not the star anymore. Yeah, that's, that's just the way it it's is. It's a sad truth, but he's the he is carrying the load for, for the pokes, and that's why they're winning. Yeah. That's Offensive right. line has to get a huge oh, credit yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was the biggest question mark in the whole season coming in is the offensive line that got a little healthier, got better, gelled, and that's the – that's why the offense is good. It's the offensive line. The offensive line that's opening up the holes and uh, Gordon's running through, and then when they're not there, he's good enough to kind of make somebody miss or run through a tackle. You know, it's all kind of – it's just all working. It's still water right now. And it's a, it's crazy how much, like, a month ago, no, neither fan base wanted to play Bedlam. Oh, which you didn't want to play it because they didn't want to lose – Oh, you didn't want to play it because they didn't want to lose to the worst OSU team in forever. That's not the case anymore. You know what I mean? It's now yeah. it's now you get the feeling that one fan base is can't wait for that game to start at two thirty on Saturday. The other one is not liking it. And when that's the situation, normally it doesn't go so well for one side. Yep. Early thoughts. Um, I'm trying not to be overreactive, but I'm a heavy lean OSU right now. 
It's hard not to be. It, but the way those two teams have played in the last couple of weeks. Now we'll, we'll be back to wrap it up on a Monday. We were sitting around the office one day and tried to explain what Western Oklahoma Realty was. If you had to put it in a dictionary, what would you get? What kind of definition you would get? I think I said is, a, what about, were people before property? People before property means to me that you care about the person more than you care about what they're buying in that you want them to get the best thing for their circumstances, the best home, the best investment. For all your real estate needs, give Western Oklahoma Realty a call at 225-6271. The Skinny on Sports. Yeah! Coming on, yeah! Welcome back. Skinny on Sports, 98.1 FM, the sports animal. Already got a prediction for Bedlam. Our man Billy, 35-21 Sooners. Joe wins. Stutzman doesn't play. OU will get killed. Listen, I, Stutzman, well, I it, had a feeling that if he was not on the field, that was – If it's, I have a feeling that was a thing. If it's really a high ankle sprain, he ain't playing. That was kind of what the radio thought, the radio broadcast was saying toward the end. It's what we, what we were told was uh, – was that. Yeah, it, it – uh, Brent's – Press, press conference. What was that today? Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. That's going to be the first question asked, I'm sure. Yeah, and there's a bunch. It's not just him. No, there's a lot out. Sooners, all the injury luck they had in 2000 <laughs> may have ruined it for the rest of the uh, rest of time. Because <laughs> there's some there's some guys hurt. But that's the what what was what we heard all year. It's competitive. Yeah, we'll find it. It's not an excuse. Got to figure it out. And going to Stillwater for Bedlam may not be the best place to try to figure that out. Mm. World Series tonight, Game 3, Jared. Your Texas Rangers won an absolute classic on Friday night in Game 1. Seager hitting the two-run home run to tie it in the ninth, and then Garcia walking it off in the 11th for a one nothing win. And then Merrill Kelly came back in Game 2 for Arizona, pitched a gem, seven innings, only gave up a run, and Arizona wins 9-1, evening the series at one apiece. What is your pulse? Well, I mean, based on recent history, obviously, you got to feel good about going on the road. But this is this is the World Series. Arizona is here for a reason, uh, as evident on Saturday night. Um, we'll see what Max Scherzer can do. A third start in the postseason, first one not so well, better in the second one. Can he? The the that's the thing. Here's what what I took away after Saturday night, and I'll say it, Ranger fans. I'm sorry. They got they escaped Friday night after a bad performance from Evalde. They were some, ironically the bullpen was actually pretty good. Um, Saturday Montgomery was not good, and we saw what happened. So realistically, I mean they they could be down o two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you think? yeah. So I'm uh, but again the recent history of the the Road Warriors here. Um. I think I said Rangers in six. I'm sticking with it. I I think they they grab a couple here on the road. Yeah, starting pitching has got to be better. Yeah, it's it's got to be. That better. is what I was hanging my hat on coming into this was the starting pitchers pitcher pitching has been fantastic up until now, and that's scary. Yeah, it's got to be better because we know. Yeah, the bullpen was great in in game one. There's no doubt about it, and they were as big a part as any of winning that game, holding. Arizona at five throughout the middle to late innings. Yep. And allowing, you know, Seeger to have a chance like that. But that's the that's kind of the scary part, right? Because of the starters you, you don't expect that to happen. If your starters can't get you six, maybe seven innings, six for sure, then as as Ranger fan, you can't feel very good at all about the prospects there because of of the bullpen struggles. But and and Arizona's bullpen's been lights out, and then game one, Seager hits a home run there off of uh, Seawall. He hadn't given up hits, much less a bomb. But uh, and, and kudos, give Tavares credit for coaxing that walk, battling to get the walk to lead off that, that bottom of the ninth inning that then allowed it not to just be a 5-4 final when Seager went deep. Yeah, he's a guy that um, – what is the uh... – the manager from the A's, Billy Bean, mm-hmm. and, you know, obviously from Moneyball, and favorite one of my favorite lines in that movie is, 
he gets on base. Do I care how he gets on base? That's he, yeah. He get he got on and, and yeah he, he gets on base. He's not he's batting nine hole for a reason, but he he's been uh, there are times in, in not just this series but in this postseason where he will get on, and then it turns the lineup up to the top of the lineup, and then you know even though if uh, uh, Simeon will pop out, I mean then you go into the next at bat you're going two three four right there in the, your best hitters so that's why it's a big and big to just get on base and he got on base but they'll need a lot more base runners tonight they, i mean i think our arizona's offense is they're, they're just the tenacious man just they keep coming at you Brandon. timely timely hitting mm-hmm. it's not with the long ball necessarily just timely hitting then we'll see what happens it should I, i'm i'm kind of a slight lean for Texas to respond because of Scherzer, I, I can't see him having a mediocre third outing in the playoffs. I think he he's been on this stage before. And if he's dialed in, and we'll know quickly if he is or isn't, they're going to have a good chance. I just it's hard for me to see the Rangers just scoring one run in mm-hmm. consecutive games. Brandon Fat uh, goes for Arizona. He pitched Game Seven of the NLCS and was really pretty good uh, in that game for uh, for the Diamondbacks. So. No, Jimmy. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> tomorrow it'll be me. Programming is it'll be me tomorrow. Foggy mess right now. No, but uh, it'll be it'll be fun. Also, Thunder, good start. Even though they got demolished yesterday by the defending champs in their home opener, to go two and zero on the, in those two road games, Chicago, the comeback against Cleveland on Friday night, then yesterday, you know, listen, they got whipped. There's no doubt about that by Denver, but. I think if you if you just said in these first three games you go two and one, now you got a whole bunch of home games going. I think everybody would be more than happy about that. You know, you see you see the promise. You also see what's missing, right? When I mean, well, nobody's gotten Jokic in the entire league, but you know, there's there's still that void of of being able to a big giant strong dude like that down low. There ain't a ton of them left in the NBA like there used to be. But the ones that are are obviously going to give Oklahoma City trouble. Yeah, yeah, ab- uh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, you got like the start to. Uh, I mean, you go on the road, you win your two first games. That's that's pretty good. Denver, it is what it is, and I think that's just what we kind of expected from the Thunder of our expectations of them of uh, forty five win type team. Going up against the defending champs, we know what Denver. Their expectations are higher than that. So that that I don't take too much away from from what happened last or yesterday afternoon in Oklahoma City. Still a good team, and um, they'll bounce back. They'll be fine. Yeah, the only thing kind of st- it was, Oklahoma City's normally kind of played Denver pretty well, even with Jokic. Uh, it just didn't happen last uh, yesterday afternoon, one twenty eight ninety five. But here's the thing: tonight, Detroit. Then New Orleans comes in on Wednesday. Golden State on Friday. Trey Young in Atlanta a week from today, and then Cleveland a week from Wednesday. So you're talking about that was the first of what six in a row, one, two, three, four, yeah, six in a row at home. So if you can come out of that four and two with the two, and now you're six and two, that's a heck of a good start uh, with some road games coming up after that. So it's a work in progress. There's no doubt about it. And big guys are going to give Oklahoma City a ton of trouble uh, with the lack of, of of a true say a defensive center. Chet can play. Chet can swat shots. I don't know that Chet can avoid getting backed down by the guys like Nikola Jokic, which, like I said, he's a different animal, and mm-hmm. not everybody has one. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was uh, it was uh, it was a tough go of it yesterday, but a good start for the Oklahoma City Thunder. And here's the truth: Chet doesn't matter, Jokic doesn't. All that, all that is you can say whatever you want to, but if Che Gilgis Alexander goes two for sixteen, Oklahoma City's not going to win again. No, no. That's just it was a tough shooting night for him. He's been great to start. He wasn't yesterday, and you know they just they Oklahoma City can't win very many games if uh, if Chet plays or if uh, SGA plays right. or shoots the ball like that. I yep. tell you, who's fun? Casey Wallace. Yeah. Is he still? He still hasn't missed a three. Out of how many shots? Five or six. <laughs> huh. Everybody have a great Monday. You've been listening to the Skinny on Sports podcast with Aaron Cow. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to get alerts of when the latest podcast is available. Thanks for listening.